Panel number four is going to be discussing mental health, humanitarian healthcare crisis. This panel discussion of the humanitarian and healthcare related destruction in Gaza and its far reaching impact in the US related to government response and policy, specifically to foreign aid responsibilities and commitments to safeguarding hospitals, healthcare and humanitarian workers, as well as American people. Uh, I just wanna say this is one of the most important topics we have been hearing on Capitol Hill. Uh, there are gonna be long-term consequences with the war in Gaza and I'm so thrilled to introduce our panel moderator, uh, Faraz Siddiqui, who is a healthcare attorney with a background in public health, and he is also serving as the Vice President for the American Muslim Health Professionals. Thank you. Salam so alaikum, everyone. Thank you for staying with us for, for the last panel. I know it's uh, that time of the afternoon that we are, we are beginning to lose our, um, our focus and uh, our energy. Um, inshallah, we have a good uh, discussion ahead of, ahead of us. Um, as was mentioned, I, I, I'm a healthcare attorney um, with uh, a public health background. I did some work and studies in uh, healthcare in regions of war and political conflict. Um, but have, uh, don't have as much experience as our distinguished panels over here. Um, hence, I'm only the moderator. Um, we will discuss today uh, the impact of, um, of the genocide as it relates to the, uh, the, the healthcare infrastructure in Gaza and then tie it back to uh, policies, uh, maybe, uh, you know, issues and uh, concerns and uh, solutions in uh, policy, domestic and international policies of the United States. This morning, I read uh, that a team uh, from the BBC uh, went to what's left of Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza. They found four mass graves. They found people with marks of field execu executions, torture bindings, gunshots to the head. They found dead women, children, headless victims. All of these are the makings of genocide. These have been in the annals of history as, as genocidal crimes. Yet the US Congress is getting ready to invite Netanyahu. The U.S. prides itself as the leader of the world. However, we are rewarding this genocide with more military aid. Israel's stance is that, and quote, no staff or patients died as a direct result of, its, uh, of, the, uh, of Israel's actions, but that some may have died of natural causes, they say. There was not even a single civilian casualty. Those are the uh, official words of uh, the spokesman of, uh, of Israel, for Israel. <clears throat> Our last panel includes Dr. Zahloul, a critical care specialist in Chicago who heads Med Global, an NGO that has been working in Gaza for many years, uh, and also since October 7th. Um, we also have Dr. Farah Abbasi, an award-winning psychiatrist from Michigan State University who has been working on barriers that stigmatize and silence mental health and encourages the Muslim community to integrate rather than isolate from the mainstream. And lastly, we have Mariam Muzaffar, who has been writing legislation for over 20 years <laughs> at both the state and federal level. She'll share some of her insights into how we as a Muslim community can be a powerful voice as a community and affect solutions in American policy. The way that we decided to do this is have some questions uh, for uh, Dr. Zahloul uh, and then uh, have a discussion with um, uh, Dr. Abbasi and then finally uh, work our way uh, to this, uh, uh, this side of, uh, of the stage with Maria. Dr. 
Zahlul has uh, done, I, I just want to add a little bit more about, uh, about uh, each speaker before I uh, uh, start asking questions, inshallah. So Dr. Zahlul is, a, uh, as I said, a critical care physician in Chicago. He's done work. He, 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 he in, formerly served as the uh, president of the Syrian American Muslim uh, Medical Society and has led medical missions in natural and man-made disasters such as Syria, Ukraine, Colombia, Puerto Rico, Gaza, Yemen, and Bangladesh. He's been a leading voice in, global health, in the global health community due to his strong commitment on advancing medical care in resource-limited settings. He's published widely on the impacts of war on health. He's also associate professor of clinical medicine at the University of uh, Illinois in Chicago. Um, Dr. Zahlul, when we, when we talked about the, um, about the panel uh, and the kind of message that we want to uh, share with, with our audience today, I remember you saying something. You said, you know, m medical missions form a small part of what we do. You said we don't just parachute in to save the people and then parachute out. That's not what organizations like MedGlobal do, and that's not the, the way that you can really uh, work with an uh, organization, sorry, with a community. Can you please tell us a little bit more about the work that MedGlobal does uh, in Gaza, in Palestine, um, especially you know, the work that you did, have done before October 7th and the kind of work that you'll continue to do after, inshallah. Well, thank you for having me, and I'm really honored to be among you. Um, and thank you for the nice introduction, uh, Faraz. Um, and I just want to preface that with some observation that I hope that uh, next policy day we'll have more diversity, uh, not only within the Muslim community, but also uh, our neighbors and partners, because it's important for us not only to speak to the choir, uh, right? And, and also I want to just uh, give credit to the people who started uh, these um, uh, gatherings and these discussions. I remember when I first came to the United States 32 years ago, I went to one of the ISNA conferences and I heard Dr. Hathoud, um, and at that time I had no idea uh, who is Dr. Hathoud. And he was talking about the importance uh, of uh, uh, Muslim Americans participate uh, in civic engagement and at the highest level. And his organization, IMPACT, is still uh, going strong. And I give credit to Dr. Hathoud and Salam Muriati and to the people who started uh, the foundation for our involvement in the political scene. And I'm seeing now second and third generation Muslims who are quite involved, including my son, uh, who works in, in the government. Um, the other um, you know, introduction is the fact that you know, when I attended these conferences of ISNA and other organizations, um, I learned that my faith uh, is not only to pray and fast and give zakat, but also to be the best uh, in your job and give to others, to your neighbors, and care about your country and your city um, and be engaged with the community. So, uh, and also to be morally consistent. We cannot just focus on the tribe, uh, on Muslims, and forget others. So if you care about health, you have to care about the health of people in Chicago, the health of people in the United States, the health mm -hmm. of people in um, Gaza, Ukraine, and other countries. And if you are morally consistent, then you are more effective. So that's why MediGlobal um, was established 2017 with a group of diverse humanitarians. We started at that time with three crises in Yemen, uh, in the Rohingya refugee crisis in Bangladesh, and in Syrian crisis, by sending doctors and nurses and with time, we evolved. We worked in more than 25 countries. Our mission is to improve access to health care uh, in disaster areas and low-income communities. And I always tell the story that I work in two hospitals in Chicago. One of them is a small community hospital in mostly African-American and Latino community. And the other one is tertiary center, similar to Al-Shifa Hospital, um, in an area that is uh, mostly white. Uh, and the life expectancy in the first area is 10 years less the second area in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So we have health inequity in the United States. We have problems in our country here, and we have to care about them. Last year, uh, more than 100,000 people died because of drug overdose that are preventable in the United States. So if we want to preach about the welfare of other people in the world, we have also to talk to about 
what's happening <laughs> in our country. So th that's the preface. But in Gaza, of course, uh, as an NGO, as a medical NGO, we were involved since 2019. And it's important what you have mentioned, that you don't just pay attention to a, a country or to a place when there's a crisis. You have to be engaged in countries that have are prone to, to disasters or low-income communities for the long term, because you need to learn about the people, you need to learn about the health um, issues, you need to uh, learn about the social determinant of health, you need to learn about the healthcare systems. So I was, my first mission in Gaza was in 2019. I worked in Al Shifa Hospital. Um, I worked in Nasser Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Gaza four times before this war. And we send medical missions every three, three months or four months of doctors and nurses who are focused on training uh, because you want to build resiliency within local communities by not only giving them fish medicine and medical supplies and medical technology, but also teach them how to fish. And by partnering with the local community, then you are building resiliency. Right now, none of us, I'm talking about people who are living in the United States, are in Gaza, but we have 140 doctors and nurses in Gaza who are local physicians and nurses who are running our 10 clinics in Rafah and Deir al-Balah who are serving 4,000 patients every day. So building resiliency through partnering with local community is what we do in, in Med Global, not only in Gaza, but also in Ukraine, in Colombia, in Mexico, in Bangladesh, in Syria, in Sudan, in Yemen, and Lebanon. And we worked in more than 25 countries over the past six years. We impacted 12 million people in the last year. Um, and I think all of us, uh, physicians and non-physicians, should be supporting organizations like Medi Global, and there are many of organizations like us who are doing really good work for the long term. Um, and, uh, and you are more effective when you are talking about Gaza if you are serving the community in Gaza for the long term. I wanted to pick on one of the things that you said, um, you know, involve the local community building resilience. Um, I know from uh, uh, public health research and other, uh, you know, uh, other uh, understandings of how global health works, that if you don't involve a community in their own healthcare, in their own, uh, uh, you know, survival and, 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 uh, and how to thrive, then you, you fail, you fail at a higher rate um, than if uh, you have them as, uh, not only you know, as uh, employees, but as decision makers, as leaders. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how MedGlobal works with the health cluster in Gaza, how you, uh, you, know, how, how you maybe divide uh, work with the other organizations, how you train, it would be really nice to, to, to hear about some of that, to, to see how, how some of these things uh, work on the ground. Very important question for us, and uh, you know, there's two concepts in global health which I think is important uh, for us to understand. The first one, and by the way, I'm not Palestinian, I'm, I'm Syrian, and I think we should have a Palestinian American in this panel. Uh, I know that you tried, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but people who are from the same country speak better than, uh, than people who are from other countries. I, I'm proud to speak on behalf of the Palestinian doctors and the nurses that I work with. Um, very dignified people, some of the best doctors and the nurses that I work with, but I think we should have uh, Palestinians speaking on their issues. Right, Adam? Okay. Uh, and uh, so um, localization. Localizations, that mean you are partnering with local communities in order to make sure that their health is better. That means the local community determine what are their priorities. Local community determine, uh, participate in the decision making. They design the program that we have. And this is something that we do in every country that we go there. We are registered in Gaza as an NGO for four years. We are part of the health cluster. That means we coordinate with the UN agency, with the WHO, with the local health authorities, with the international NGOs to make sure that we do not duplicate uh, the care and we make sure that we work based on the priorities of the local community. When the war started in Gaza, we asked um, our friends in Gaza, what is the main thing that you would like us to do in the first few months? And they said, we don't have medical supplies. We have shortage of medical supplies. So we made sure that medical supplies, our team in Gaza procured medical supplies and distributed to the hospitals in Gaza. Then we asked them, what is your priority in the second phase of the war? And they said, um, the healthcare system is near collapse. That means 
people do not have access to health care. People who were displaced from Gaza City, from Jabalia, from Beit Lahia to the south, now they don't have clinics to go to. Um, only 16 out of 36 hospitals are now operating. The two uh, tertiary centers in Gaza, Al Shifa Hospital, that serves 750,000 patients every year and perform more than 25,000 surgery every year and have 70,000 dialysis session every year, is closed. And you cannot just replace a tertiary center with a small field hospital. So because of that, we focused on building capacity on the primary health by opening clinics that provides uh, care for the uh, children, for the women uh, in the prenatal care, for the elderly, for patients who have chronic diseases, for wound care and mental health support. So that's how we partner with local community and that's why we, it's important to be part of the health cluster. The second concept, and I'll just do it briefly, is decolonization. Mm -hmm. Global health in general was built on the idea that we know what is better for you. We are in the United States and, and, and in Europe. We know what's better for people in Bangladesh or in Pakistan or in Syria or in Gaza. Uh, and we, are, uh, we embrace the idea of decolonization. That means people in every country know what is better for them. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, once you leave uh, a situation, uh, once you leave a, a country where your operations are, uh, are being uh, rolled out, uh, you uh, as in you personally and as, as an organization, and come back to, to the United States. I know that you continue your work. Your work doesn't stop. Um, in fact, in the United States, it takes another, uh, you know, uh, another facet. It, uh, I know that you've um, worked in coalitions to advocate on behalf of the people suffering in Gaza, uh, people who are the victims of the genocide. Can you tell us a, a little bit about that work over there, um, and, uh, and especially the idea of staying apolitical in, um, you know, in the face of, uh, of, of different pe uh, parties, uh, uh, you know, that may be in an, in a different party that might be in an administration, different people voting uh, in ways that might not be in the best, uh, in our best interest. Uh, I know that Met Global strives uh, in its healthcare missions uh, to, 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 to stay apolitical and, and try and get to the, uh, to the actual issues that are most uh, a priority for, for, for the people in Gaza. Can you talk uh, to us a little bit about that? Yeah, and I'm, I'm eager to hear uh, uh, the experts on, on this panel. Uh, you know, I, I'm just going to tell stories, you know, and uh, it's important. For, I'm a physician, so um, my full-time job is a pulmonary and critical care physician in Chicago. Um, I have a clinic. I have hospitals to go to. Uh, so when we go into medical missions, and we call, we call it resiliency medical missions, so it's not only that you go there and you do some procedures and then you come back and that's it. Actually, this is not good. It's harmful for the population if you just do it that way. And there is right now a trend where people go just to Gaza or to crisis area and take pictures and say we are heroes and then they come back. This is not good for the community that we serve. So when I go there, actually, I'm not only working as a physician. I, yeah, I saw patients in the clinic. I went to the ICU in Nasser Hospital. It was open at that time and saw patients there. Uh, but my contribution to the uh, people in Gaza was after I came back, the most important contribution. My clinical contribution was small, but uh, by advocating on what I have seen and advocating it in a way that is neutral, uh, talking about facts and numbers and stories, that humanized the uh, Palestinian people in Gaza to policymakers, to the media, to the public, to our neighbors. So I always mention the story that you know, in one of the mass casualty events in Nasser Hospital, there was a missile that hit an area near the hospital. Uh, and I was in the emergency room, and 32 patients came, uh, some of them on the back of their family, some of them on a carriage that pulled by a donkey, and some of them in cars uh, with all kinds of injuries. Most of them are children. Um, and seven of them were dead on arrival. And people did not have a space to resuscitate them in the emergency room because they had limited resources. They did not have enough medical supplies. They did not have an MRI. 
and we had to resuscitate one of the patients who was 12 years old, and his name is Muhammad Khalil Abu Shahla, who was displaced with his family from East Khan Yunis to the area around the hospital on the floor of the emergency room. Dr. Thayer Ahmad, who's a Palestinian-American physician who's a board member of MediGlobal, uh, intubated him, put him on life support. And then he had abdominal surgery because he has shrapnels. And he never woke up. I took care of him next day, and he never woke up. We pronounced him dead. We were not able to communicate with his family. I took a picture of his um, death certificate and made sure that I share it not only with, with the media and with policymakers, with Senator Durbin and Senator Duckworth, who are my senators, but also with Pres President Biden. When I had uh, um, the privilege to meet with him in the White House for an hour and a half, I spoke with him about what's going on in Gaza, about the stories of the impact of war on Gaza, and the numbers that one out of 100 children in Gaza have been killed, which is the equivalent of half a million American children, that 5% of the people in Gaza have been either killed or injured, which is the equivalent of 18 million Americans being killed or injured in a matter of six months. So when you put these language and numbers into perspective, in stories, and you show pictures to people, you actually humanize the people that you serve, and you impact policy. And this is the hard work that now you do by writing policy issues, but it is important for us not only to talk about right reports and uh, talk about numbers, but humanizing the people that we serve, and you reach the hearts of the people, no matter how hard these uh, hearts are. Thank you for the work that uh, that you do uh, with Med Global. <clears throat> um, let's take a little bit of a pivot uh, uh, and hear from Dr. Farha Abbasi. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Abbasi is an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Psychiatry at Michigan State University. She's a faculty member of the Muslim Studies program there. She's won numerous awards, uh, most recently uh, the American Psychiatrist Association's Assembly Award for uh, Profile of Courage for uh, speaking out on behalf of the vulnerable uh, people in Gaza. She's also the first Muslim on the board of the American Psychiatric Association Foundation. Um, Dr. Abbasi is well known in the American Muslim mental health community as, uh, as the founding director of the annual Muslim Mental Health Conference which is already, I believe, 16 years old now. Um, she's launched similar initiatives in Malaysia and Jordan. She also edits the Journal of Muslim Mental Health, um, and um, uh, she's the director of the Muslim Mental Health Consortium at Michigan State. So thank you. Thank you for, for uh, joining us today. Um, so again, you know, we are, we are talking about we, we, we want to uh, get a little bit of a better, fuller idea of the, the, the sort of um, mental health crisis that, that we have uh, in a situation like Gaza. We know that war destroys communities uh, and families. We know that the mental health impacts are both short-term and long-term. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of the kinds of mental health uh, uh, sure. you know, uh, impacts that it has, uh, especially uh, in children? Yes. So. Um Assalamu alaikum. Can you guys hear me? So, you know, we say assalamu alaikum and we say be at peace, but I say be peace because I think for the first time I feel our peace is really threatened. Um, I want to start with the poem by Musab Abu Taha, a Palestinian poet who wrote this to his doctor. Um, when you open my ear, touch it gently. My mother's voice lingers somewhere inside. Oops. OK. I'm sorry. I'm trying to. Her voice is the echo that helps recover my equi equilibrium when I feel dizzy during my attentiveness. You may encounter songs in Arabic, poems in English I recite to myself, or a song I chant to the chirping, bir chirping birds in our background. When you stitch the cut, don't forget to put 
all these back in my ear, put them back in an order as you would do with books on a shelf. The drone's buzzing sound, the roar of an F-16, the screams of bomb falling on houses, on fields, on bodies of rockets flying away, rid my small ear, <sighs> sorry, rid my small ear canal of them all, spray the perfume of your smiles on the incision. Inject the song of life into my veins to wake me up. Gently beat the drum so my mind may dance with yours, my doctor, day and night. Trauma. What do we understand of trauma? Trauma is not the incident or event that happens. That's the injury. Trauma is the after effects of that injury, the aftermath of that. So think of it in terms of head injury. This is injury, but the swelling of the brain is the trauma. And trauma not only impacts you mentally, impacts you physically, it impacts you socially. And trauma not only happens when if you are at the moment of crisis or in the chaotic situation, trauma even happens by relation. So as Muslims, we know the concept of ummah is very infused in all of us. So when we see or hear of what is happening in Gaza, the level of the trauma, the pain that we all are imbibing is also traumatic. So one thing is what is really happening there, but also how it constantly is impacting each one of us. What is happening there from a mental health provider point of view? We already knew that even before this conflict, 50% of the children were very depressed and had thoughts of hurting themselves. These are children I'm talking about. And this is before the crisis. Right now, we also know that the mental health providers in, from Gaza or Palestine, they don't talk about post-traumatic stress disorder because there's nothing post that's happening. It's persistent stress that they are living in. And the Western DSM-4, 5, TR, whatever we are using, does not even fathom or can start, begin to apply to what the kind of trauma that's unfolding in, in there, impacting there. So if we look at the world globally right now, Muslims are the most vulnerable. Most Muslims are being killed in the war against terrorism or on hands of terrorists. Most Muslims displaced. Most Muslims uh, turning, uh, losing their homes and becoming refugees or in exile. You have a generation of Muslim youth that are growing that will have no country to call as their home. So we, we are in already, uh, were on a precipice of mental health meltdown, but this situation right now is really deeply impacting each one of us. So I can give you an example. As, as trauma healer, when we talk about healing from uh, trauma of this level, you, you talk about touch, touch of love, feeling safe, secure, right? So hugging, you, you, you teach a trauma victim to hug themselves. And I was reading a provider talking about how do you do this trauma healing with children who have no arms to hug themselves or hug anyone else? So 
how is it impacting them? We also know this, this is a very unique crisis that in which there is a deliberate victim is the infrastructure. The infrastructure of that Gaza is, being, is under attack, be it hospital, be it agriculture, be it anything else. So of course, the mental health infrastructure is also debilitated. First of all, it was already struggling. It was already overwhelmed. And now, right now, it's really under attack. So where do we even begin to have this conversation is my concern. Because it's just not going to end at this point. Trauma stays in your mind and stays in your body. We know that trauma changes epigenetics and can be passed from generation to generation to generation. But another unique aspect that we are suffering from here in America is that we are being treated like others, but we are internalizing this otherness. Mm -hmm. Even in the previous panel, the concern I have is the policies that are being created in interest of national interest. But national interest means an interest of the people of that nation. And we are people of this nation. We have not just suddenly sprouted in America. If President Jefferson felt the need to buy a holy Quran to design the constitution of this country, he knew that or understood that or wanted to integrate us in the system. So we have been here from the beginning of America. And we are the new face of America. And we cannot let this concept, this policies of otherizing us internalize it, and start to feel as others. We have to own our citizenship, because as a mental health provider, I also work with identity building. And I think it is so integral to own our identities. Even if hyphenated, we need to own it fully. So I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I've wrapped up all the questions in one. <laughs> yeah, you did pretty well. Um, so we can, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 this is, this, this is great. You know, I wanted to give you a chance, um, you know, both uh, uh, on, on behalf of you, your colleagues, and Dr. Zahlul's uh, colleagues. As, as healthcare providers, you are also getting what you call a relational trauma from, from, from the news from Gaza, but maybe even your uh, own patients uh, uh, in Gaza or over here, um, you are the ear that listens uh, to them. Can you tell us, a, and especially this comes after COVID, where the, the healthcare infrastructure over here was, was uh, stressed to, to, to its maximum. Um, can you shed a little bit light on that, on this, um, you know, on, on healing the healer and how, um, how, how doctors and uh, other healthcare uh, per personnel can take care of themselves? I think uh, as much as we are seeing the relentless brutality, we are also seeing ruthless apathy to the situation. So if we talk about trauma-informed care, we talk about three important concepts that you have to be validated, you have to be visible, and you have to be viable. And I think right now, if we are not being validated for this trauma, and if we are being silenced or censored, first of all, I think very important message I want you all to take home today, we are not in a holy war. And please make sure that each one of us fight against that notion, them against us. Because even if we talk of Gaza, there are Muslims, there are Christians, there are Jews, 
and there are Baha'is living in that area. So it is, and another piece that is very important, that anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are two sides of the same coin. If one increases, other increases. And if we look at the history of the country, no anti-Semitism act has ever been done by a Muslim. So we cannot go with that narrative that anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are like we are at war with each other. We are not. We are each other's allies, and we have to continue to work together to fight both. So important piece to say to this, as a provider right now, and especially like I never thought like you have to be visibly Muslim, but being visibly Muslim, or uh, one of my friends says, out of closet Muslim, it, it is a scary time to be one. Because every time you open your mouth, you are very uh, censored. You, are, you have to be really careful how, what you are saying, how you are saying, and who you are saying it to. So your, your validation is not there. Your visibility, you are being put in corners or silos, and your viability is being threatened. So just a reminder, and I am so grateful to ISPU for doing this research. Look up the numbers. We make the majority of the physicians, the teachers, the firefighters, and we are one of the big philanthropist community of this country. So we are an asset to the country. Don't forget that. I just want to um, uh, please. Um, just follow up on the question about healing the healer. Um, so uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, in the St. Anthony's Hospital, which is the hospital in the west side of Chicago, um, many times we had, I have nurses in the ICU coming to me and crying because we had too many patients um, who are very sick, young patients. Many of them died on us. We did not have enough resources to treat mm -hmm. them. Um, even remdesivir, which was available in the bigger hospital, was not available in, in that hospital in Chicago. That means some patients did not get remdesivir, which is the mainstay of treatment of COVID pandemic. We had, uh, in the first, especially in the first couple of months of the crisis, we, had, we did not have enough PPE. So my hospital was handing us a mask, and you have a, a, a plastic bag, and you have to keep the mask for one week. We did not have enough masks. So dealing with limited resources. So imagine yourself in Gaza, you're a physician or a nurse, um, and you have very limited resources to treat the large influx of patients who are coming to your emergency room, patients who are very sick, young and old and women and children uh, who have shrapnels, who have gruesome injuries. I, th I think most of, uh, most of you have seen it on the videos. Um, and you don't have surgeons uh, to treat them. You do not have advanced technology to treat them. And you have to decide whether you, you, know, you let this uh, child die because you're not able to take care of them. Uh, or um, maybe you can direct your attention to the other child because he or she has higher chance of living than the other child. And this happened, by the way, thousands of times. That means people or patients you were able to save in the peacetime, you're not able to save in the wartime. Not only that, but yourself is displaced as a physician or a nurse. That means you are living in a tent. And that, you know, that's like 90% of the, of the physicians in Gaza right now are displaced themselves. That means there is a possibility that a bomb will kill your family in the tent or kill you. Or the hospital that you are working in will be attacked or targeted, like what we have seen in many of the hospitals. So the trauma that doctors and nurses in, um, in Gaza are going through, and other war zones, by the way, that happen in Syria, in Ukraine, right. Right. and other places are uh, unimaginable to us here in the United States. Uh, so sometimes we talk about healing 
the victims of war, mm -hmm. but we forget about healing the, the doctors healers. and the yeah. nurses and the humanitarians yeah. who are dealing with them. One of the doctors, Dr. Mohammed Khandil, very bright doctor. By the way, doctors in Gaza are some of the best doctors I have seen. They're better than us. I always mention that. Uh, and more up to date on medical knowledge than us here in the United States. And they de they're very creative because they've been always having limited resources. So they are creative. So um, he was in the ICU in Nasser Hospital. Um, he returned from um, outside. He had training in Qatar. Yeah. And he, wa he had the option to work in Qatar, but he returned to Gaza because he wanted to serve his yeah, community. Okay. So a few weeks ago, he called me. He said, I cannot take it anymore. Uh, I was able to send my family to Egypt. Is there any way that I leave? Because I cannot function uh, uh, anymore. So it's happening. Uh, and I think that we don't have enough resources to heal the healers in Gaza. And they are the ones who will be you know, treating their communities uh, after the war stops. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Abbasi. Thank you for, um, uh, and uh, Dr. Zahlul also, um, for, for laying the sort of foundation. I mean, this is, this is the, the impact on the healthcare uh, infrastructure. There is, you know, uh, life is not just about healthcare, there's so many other facets. And you can have a similar panel, you can have a, <laughs> much more uh, spoken about and written about each and every aspect food, about uh, education kids who, who are not going to school. Um, so you know, we, we can now see how the work um, of professionals in different areas is very important to bring to policymakers over here uh, to start the conversation or to humanize uh, uh, the, the, the people of Gaza and start the conversation on policy change. Um, we will have um, uh, Maria Muzaffar help us close off the session. Um, and okay. uh, frankly, close off the, um, uh, the, the uh, today's conference okay. on a um, <laughs> uh, on on some of the uh, uh, on some solutions that we can uh, we can uh, take that we can start on that we can work on uh, for some of the, uh, for a lot of these uh, issues. Um, Maria has been uh, writing uh, and crafting uh, groundbreaking legislation for over 20 years. Um, including seven laws uh, that relate to the Muslim community, uh, such as uh, Islamophobia, uh, criminal justice reform, uh, uh, and um, uh, some laws that uh, involve healthcare, such as healthcare for incarcerated individuals. Uh, she's also uh, working on getting congressional hearings uh, at the federal level to speak about Islamophobia and other issues that, uh, that affect uh, the Muslim uh, community. She's uh, worked on advocacy and, and research for the foreign policy of America and for Human Rights Watch. Um, uh, Maria, uh, thank you for, for uh, joining us. Um, before I ask you a question, I wanted to just so, sort of give you, give you a lay uh, of the land of something that I think was, uh, I was astounded when, when I saw, um, you know, you, you, you told us in our uh, discussion, you told us there's nothing more powerful than the legislative code. Getting mm -hmm. a law that uh, hopefully stays in perpetuity and it's the binding law of, of the nation. There are 38 uh, states in the United States, 38 states in the United States that have laws on the, book, on the books that require government employees or any government contractors to, to certify that they will not boycott Israel. 38 states in the United States that have this. Some, uh, some of them specifically call out Israel. Others say any uh, boycotts we, we can't, uh, we won't be part of. They have to certify to this every year. They have to certify it before they get a job. Um, so you know, there's, there's been there's been a lot of work that's been done over the years. It 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 sort of slaps in the face of all the protesters, uh, all the letter writing campaigns that we have been uh, working on. Um, of, of trying to boycott Israel, you know, so, so there is something to be said of, of that legislative code. So, uh, you know, we, we welcome uh, Maria's uh, thoughts on this. Um, so let, let, let me uh, start off by uh, getting a little bit of the background of the work that you did. You, you said you've been a legislative drafter for uh, 20 years uh, and have had some, uh, some of these victories. Can you tell us a little bit about um, you know, uh, about these successes um, 
and maybe how you, you went about uh, yeah. getting that? Well, I want to be, uh, thank you so much. And I'm so touched by um, the stories of the physicians. And that's what I spoke with, with, <laughs> with Varaz. I said, can you please let have the, have the physicians have their floor and honor their work uh, on a panel on health care? And I can add. And so I appreciate that that, has, that is how we did it. Um, I want to start out by saying that. And your husband is one of them. Yeah, he is. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah, and I hope he's watching live stream. Um, so, but I, I, I do want to say that I, I want to now speak about the, as you say, the power of policy and the power of code. And I want to also reaffirm your statements that so much of how you view yourself as a community and as an individual is how you will relate with the power institutions that are around you. So institutionalized racism, institutionalized discrimination, it is successful for various reasons, uh, money, uh, um, access, right, decision making, being in the room. But why it's extremely powerful uh, and successful is because people believe themselves what they are told that they are. So if you feel that you're an invisible community, do not come and tell a legislator um, that you haven't seen us because you've already called yourself invisible. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to know where you stand and where you come from and uh, understand your power. Um, to speak about the victory, so I have been writing legislations, uh, alhamdulillah, I've had the opportunity for the last 20 years. And I share this only for the sake of learning and for the sake of sharing uh, my lessons learned in the process. All of them have successfully become law. And I have understood very clearly why that is. It's not a magic touch that anybody, that anybody has. Um, the, the strategy is, number one, how you enter into the space that you walk into. If you are walking into a space and halls of power as the powerless, then you will be handed just what you can have. And they will estimate what you can handle. Mm -hmm. But if you walk in with a, a role of equity and partnership, um, and you define that for yourself, then what you do is you actually create legislation and values for the nation beyond what the legislator can even recognize. Mm. And I think that's what we have to really concentrate on is when we talk about addressing issues, whether it be in healthcare, criminal justice uh, reform, education, you think about the idea of a new way of being. And we talk about this a lot uh, with our team, is how do you create something that they've never imagined? And really, for Muslims, that's very easy for us. It's easy for us because we have imagined and we've, we've seen and we've been taught to aspire towards it and to live towards it. So when we talk about legislations in any aspect, we need to figure out if it's ad addressing the issues concerned, but is it resulting in mercy? And if it's not resulting in mercy for somebody, making life a little bit easier for somebody else, and speaking truth, which is a commandment in the Quran, then the legislation is not living up to its ideals for us. And so that's what we advocate for. As far as the strategy beyond being powerful, being clear on who you are, knowing your assets, and speaking truth, um, we also have to understand that it is OK to lead. And 100%, we should not shy away from leading. I think many of the times we see ourselves in communities, um, statewide coalitions where we are part of a coalition, which is wonderful, amazing. And coalition building is how success is uh, resulting in. But we also have to be able to sometimes take the front seat and own our successes. And I think a lot of the times we shy away from that because internally we feel like we don't belong here yet. And that's how we uh, deal with our, our power. Specifically about um, the Palestinian issue. So alhamdulillah, I 100% I agree with Dr. Sahul that there should be a Palestinian on any panel where we're speaking about Gaza or a Palestinian, a Palestinian issue. And that goes for any uh, ethnic conflict, uh, any global conflict at all. I think we've seen also the tradition on Capitol Hill where we have, we have experts talking about the Middle East that have no relationship with the Middle East. So we don't want to perpetuate that type of ignorance. Um, but I would like to say that we go back to something that was stated in the last panel. This all ties into dehumanization. Dehumanization allows you to otherize. We understand this. But how do you actually then fight dehumanization? Um, 
And I think a very critical piece for us to understand right now is to look at what's happening around the country. So if you see the encampments around the country and you see the protests in every city and you see the statistics of what's happening in Gaza and you see healthcare workers, software engineers, um, so many individuals in different industries risking their jobs and their diplomas at Ivy League schools to be able to speak about this. And then you see the halls of Congress and you, and you turn on C-SPAN. And you literally see a disconnect. And the, the first uh, internal thought is, my god, they're so disconnected. They have no idea what's happening around the country. Well, they actually do. They 100% know what's happening around the country, but they want to make sure that it's clear to you that the people that have power actually speak in this language and talk in these terms and are making these deals. And so once you buy, buy into that visual, you actually feel you're outside of the halls of power. So I want to go back to what you said specifically about the congressional hearing. And I want to share a story because um, as you know, uh, in Congress there has been pro-Israel resolutions, eight of them, since October 7th. There have been four anti-Semitism hearings, and Muslims have no issue with anti-Semitism hearings. We don't have an issue with them because uh, the Jewish community is our allies. So we understand this. But the first casualty on U.S. soil since October 7th was a six-year-old boy that was stabbed 26 times. So how can you not have a discussion about the Palestinian narrative and the identity of who they are and what they've contributed to this nation? And then the, the second casualty that serious bodily harm was also a Palestinian college student who is now in a wheelchair for wearing a kafea, right? So we see these examples, and then you say, do, do they not watch the same news that, that we watch? Of course they do. Of course they do. But there is a deafening echo chamber. And so when we speak to legislators about why this is, we can't only just speak about why is this, come up with a solution. Have something in writing. And I would say that this is a major, major part of the success of all the legislations that have, have been passed and are replicated around the nation, alhamdulillah, is because we have come in with a solution. We don't want to come in and say, help us. We have a solution. We have experts in our community. You've stated the statistics that ISPU has uh, you know, been able to share, and we should own that. We have experts to tell us what the solutions are. You draft that code, and you, and you say, here it is. You want to be a star? You want to be a legislative star? Take it. And that's really what it is. When you come in as a partner, that is how you operate and move in these spaces. And if you don't, then somebody is doing you a favor or giving you a break or giving you a, you know, uh, an access for a short time. So that's one thing, come up with a solution. Second is for Wadea, for example. Wadea um, Al-Fayumi is an example of what is happening in this nation, of what is allowed at the highest levels in this government, right? We, we actually have a direct linear relationship in a resolution that we introduced in the Senate and in the House. Senator Durbin is carrying it in the Senate that creates a relationship between the misrepresentation of facts by an elected official that resulted in misinformation, that resulted in dehumanization, that resulted in anger, that resulted in a stabbing. So we have to be able to connect those dots through code, and we have to be able to reaffirm those in the values of what we want to see passed and represented. So that's one. Second, the congressional hearing. It is absolutely astounding that we've had so many hearings and not one Palestinian um, narrative. And so how do you actually ask for that hearing? And a lot goes into it, but, but one major way that, that, that you can have success is to be able to say that it is embarrassing. It's absolutely embarrassing for you to sponsor any resolution that is pro-Palestinian or speak about the fact that you care about the Palestinians or the Muslims or their allies, or Arabs, or speak about the truth and have a deafening echo chamber that's embarrassing. And I think, I love this phase, I love this phrase and I use it all the time, you have to create FOMO. You have to create f FOMO for legislators because everybody wants to be on the right side of history. And many times, and I would say even the communities when we're talking about getting out to vote and talking about policy, they are looking for a faith-based community to take the charge and say, here we go. Let's roll up our sleeves and here we go. 
And so that's been a major, major, um, I think, formula for success, how you navigate uh, these powers. But the, but the other thing I cannot, uh, <laughs> I can't underscore here is, is the strategy in negotiation. We talk about that a lot. Being strategic is so key. Every single word that you say matters. How you present yourself matters. What moves you make matters. When you send the email matters, right? Uh, what you say and, and who goes with you and who doesn't go with you matters. All of these things play a role. And what we need to understand is when we show up in a place of power and we work from a place of power, those strategies become very clear. From the experience of working, uh, for 20 years in this space, I have seen legislators who did not have any information, who really kind of had assumption of what the com community was, um, a misunderstanding of what we wanted. To the end, we were getting calls, and I get calls all the time like this. Okay, so how do so how do we strategize on this? So who should our allies be? Because everybody wants to be on the right side. Now, the the last portion of this that's very hard when you're dealing with legislative advocacy is the money. It really is the money, right? We argue uh, against uh, a lobby of all sorts, uh, and, and not just one sort, but we have pharma, we have different, we have the gun lobby, and, and we're playing against morality and money. And I think at the end of the day, that is the language that you have to use. You know, people say this a lot, you know, just play their game. Just play their game. Once they know that you play the game, you will eventually get played. But once you identify that you know they're playing the game and you're not going to let them, then they're going to meet you where you're at. Because then they understand you're operating at this high level. And I think that's super, super important. I'm uh, very honored that you want me to close out the conference. And I look forward to the second question, I hope. But I do want to say this, because I don't know what the second question will be. I do want to say this, is that we cannot feel uh, and internalize, just like you stated, what we see in the halls of Congress and on C-SPAN as the reality of what this nation is. We need to buy into the understanding that there is a marketing tool, and it's advertising. The advertising says you're minority, you're marginalized, and you're invisible, and you work so hard, and, and you're working really hard, and now you're, and now you're educated, and now you're finally going to get your time. But that's not the reality. The reality is the engineers, the physicians, the foundations, the architects, the teachers, they all come from communities like ours. And the only reason we haven't been in the halls of Congress is, I'll, <laughs> very clearly, we've been busy doing our jobs. Right. Be we've been like busy this. doing our jobs. So the society is flourishing, and the people on the top are taking all of it and saying it's all us. Once you can connect those dots literally and clearly, then guess what? They want to speak in that language, too. And they want to meet you there, too. And I will say, with the congressional hearing, we had many discussions. I can't share too many things about the internal discussions, but I will say this. There was never a moment um, in that, when it, when it was confirmed, there was a never a moment in which we had an opportunity for, for them to say, uh, you know, no, well, you know, we're, we're just looking at the schedules. We're trying to, we're trying to see what's going to happen here. There was a very clear understanding that they knew how important it was. They knew that the schedule excuse is never going to be bought. And they wanted to do the right thing. And that's been the case across the board. So I just want to say that, that don't go into a, a meeting with a legislator and a problem that you want to solve without a solution that you've already figured out yourself, or you feel that you are asking for something from them. They need you, and they need your vision, and they need your moral courage. And we know that right now the nation is in a moral crisis, and we should be able to call it out. And anyone that's perpetuating that moral crisis is not only morally confused, but they're morally bankrupt. And we need to use those strong terms. Thank you. Well, the, you answer the second and the third <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to, um, uh, what I wanted to get uh, some more uh, thoughts on uh, to, to finish out over here, um, you know, from, from a more um, priorities point of view, can you talk about some of those, uh, high, some of the highest legislative priorities uh, as, a, as a Muslim community? I know, you know, foreign, but both like, domestic and foreign policies that, that we want as, as a community to champion. And then, uh, you know, 
gather around those, uh, build coalitions around those, and then add to those? Uh, what in, 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 in some of the work that you've done, you've seen as, as those issues that we uh, have brought consensus over uh, and, and are low-hanging fruits? Sure. OK. First of all, you should never go for the low-hanging fruit, so I'm, gonna, I'm okay. going to fix terminology right there. Um, OK, there's, there's number one, two priorities. First, we know the priority of Palestine, of course. Uh, not only because it's a humanitarian disaster and it's uh, catastrophic, but it also is the last example of the colonial mindset. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be able to deconstruct that. And it's that the, the people that are you know, trying to create real estate with faith, we need to be able to counter that and speak in those terms. So I think that's very important. It really defines the other conflicts as well. Um, and the, sec the second one is the protection of the Constitution. So what you're seeing around the uh, encampments, and you're seeing it with the anti-Semitism legislation, which a huge Jewish community is fighting against, is because you're eroding the constitutional protections. And we remember when 9-11 happened, when the US Patriot Act was passed, they changed reasonable, uh, probable cause to reasonable suspicion. And we thought, oh my goodness, how could they possibly do this? right? And, it, and then when Trump came in, it was actually talking about national security and using national security as a reason to really look at the Constitution like a contract and find loopholes in it. And so the protection of the Constitution, I think, is very, very important for Muslim Americans. And I think right now what we're seeing is the erosion of all of that. So if you look at the definition of anti-Semitism, and then you look at the silencing of freedom in workplaces, the wearing of a kafea, uh, the ability to be able to speak how you want to speak on campuses, it's all related to freedom of speech, and eventually it will reach the freedom of religion, because guess what? You can actually create a profile of something that's suspicious and terrorist-like, which was at 9-11. So we don't want to go backward, but we see the trend. Whenever power is spoken to against in a way where it kind of challenges your structure and morality, people get uncomfortable. And people get uncomfortable, and they result in, the, in, in creating violations of, con, of the Constitution that are hidden in different ways. So I think that's very critical. Two, those are the two major things. But the third thing I want to tell you, and this is going to show up in the elections we talked about in the first panel here, we had such great speakers speak about it, is that we cannot keep our eyes off the domestic issues that are tied to legislation. Yes. So if we talk about felony records, if we talk about property ownership, if we talk about the way the education system is built on property taxes, we have to be able to uh, take all those issues and make them our own. I know something that's very, very important for us in Illinois is um, health care of the incarcerated, hmm. right, within those, within those systems, or food deserts. Fresh, fruit, uh, fresh food funds to be created in food deserts that are also healthcare deserts. They're overlaying. Again, we go back to the question of what legislation results in mercy. I think a good place to start within your state as advocates is to look around you in your state and look at where there hasn't been equity, but more importantly, where you can find a solution and create a solution and then lead with that. And what we have definitely learned in, 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 in seeing the successes is that sometimes people just want to see, like, where are we going? Where are we going? And then people start having coalition buildings and conversations, but someone's got to take the lead. And I think Muslims have to be able to take the lead. And right now, uh, all eyes are on us, 100% in this election. And so we can't, we can't pass the buck, period. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, I think we, we, are, we are time. Uh, is that OK? Um, appreciate uh, all your attention. Just in, in closing words, uh, <laughs> as we can see, uh, making. Can I say something? Yes, yes. OK. Uh, I, mean, I see a lot of uh, young people uh, in this uh, um, hall here, in this room. And uh, you know, I, I haven't seen uh, that many young people engaged civically uh, in my lifetime uh, like what we are seeing them right now. Right. So this is a good sign. Uh, but the same example that I've mentioned, that you cannot um, change the situation in Gaza just by parachuting in, parachuting mm -hmm. out. You have to do it consistently. That means you have to be civically engaged for the long time. 
Um, I see a couple of my friends here, Sarah and Marwa. Can you stand up from Citizens for Just Policy? They help us to have a briefing in the Congress uh, last week to uh, bipartisan staffers of, uh, on Gaza. So these efforts should be encouraged and supported. I'm happy that uh, most of the people here are young people. I haven't seen that before. But keep at it, and things will be better. 75% of your generation are pro-Palestine, or 80%. Mm -hmm. So 20 years from now, we will have more just policies, not only in Palestine, but everything else. Inshallah. Thank you very much.